Talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. lit. It's a unique hustle, B -b big shit. Hey. Big shit, big shit, big shit. Huh. It's a unique hustle, nigga. Big shit, big shit, big shit, big shit. Huh. Name another podcast like this. Who gonna check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Nothing, nothing, Madame. Walk on. Man, I'm feeling good about it. Hey, man. Hey, man. Another day. This is a day that the Lord has mm -hmm. made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. That was the check word, it, though. man. Hey, man. Check it, man. We got a special guest in here today, y'all. This guy right here, man, if you if you understand what going through something is today, you're going to be very, very blessed, man. This guy has he's triumphant over so many different things. He's been so triumphant. He's been going through these things and, and God been lifting him up from strength to strength. As I say it, man, my guy, Mr. Daryl Davis is in the building. What's going on, my brother? Hey, what's going on? You see, oh, man, boss talk one on one. What a boss is talk. How you doing, Mr. Maker? Hey, God, bless, man. Bless. Hey. It's just a good thing to man uh, to get you uh, on, on Boss Talk 101. When I seen your story, uh, when I heard about your story, when I started to look at uh, the man, you know what I mean? That that the, the guy that really is uh, 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 what I been through so much, but still yet he stands. This, still he stands. Still he stands. I only stand by God's amazing grace. Hey man, so Daryl, man, uh, Mister Daryl Davis in the building. What what you got for him? I know already where you going with it. I know, I know, I know, because you have such a awesome testimony. So it's like I want to know about you as a child before you got into all that trouble, before everything. I want to know how you were raised, um, who you were raised with. I want to know everything. Uh, I come from a two-parent household. I had a mother and a father, mm -hmm. uh, a brother and a sister. My father was the second black engineer for the Cotton Bell Railroad. Mm. Uh, out of Tyler, Texas. Okay. My mother worked in the school district and the medical field. So, uh, a so called a, an awesome household, but were they active in your life? Uh, very much so. Okay. I lived with them. They so, was together. Because you know, you us. have some kids, some parents um, who great jobs, have kids, and are not active, and you're in the same household. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why I asked that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we was very much uh, in little league sports. Okay. Uh, very much in church. Mm -hmm. uh, they Were had you the term. middle child or youngest, oldest? Where I'm did the you middle. fall? The middle. I'm the middle. Okay. I'm a, I have an older sister. Okay. Mm -hmm. And my brother is younger. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. And and so growing up, I mean, you was the troublemaker or was you the good kid? Let's be honest about it. I, I'm always be 100, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I was always the shy, fat kid. That they would make fun of. We yeah. would wobble, but they don't wall down and all that kind of <laughs> stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I went into a shell, but I was always how, different. At how old? I guess around seven, eight, nine. Okay. Uh, my, my my dad had us a house bill when I was 10. We moved in it. Uh, how much I guess older we were small kids. How much older is your sister than you? Uh, maybe about 12 years. Oh, way older. Uh, way older. Because when you were talking about, you know, how you were um, being teased and trouble at school and stuff like that, I think about, you know, if you had an older sister who was like a year or two, then mm -hmm. she'd be trying to defend you and stuff like that because she'd oh, be in it, the same it, school. It, it wasn't that they mm -hmm. I was fighting in school or nothing like that. They were just... Teasing. Yeah, bullying, like, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know. Uh, the biggest lie I ever heard in my life was sticks and stones may break my bones, but name would never hurt me. Yeah. Right. You know, you might break an arm or get a black eye mm -hmm. and you might not even remember that. Right. Mm -hmm. But someone that said something to us at once upon a time in our life that we might still bother us up in our adulthood. Right. Because uh, names do hurt. Uh, and with that, you know, we don't like to retaliate. And at that time, we didn't know anything about retaliation. Right. So we just went into a shell and withdraw and stayed to ourselves. Let me let me let me say this real quick because this is on my heart. I know that um, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may not never hurt me. Um, it depends on where you are spiritually, where you are. Because to me, um, yes, it's just words. If you know who you are and who you are in Christ, it can't. You know what I mean? Because at the same time, like what I've been practicing on myself personally, I can't speak for anybody else is because I can't control you. I can't control what you say. I can't control what you think. 
I can only control me as in how I perceive what you say to me. You know what I mean? So whatever you say about me or to me, if I know who I am and that I'm loved by God himself, nothing you can say can hurt me. Well, and, and that's true in, in adults, right? Mm -hmm. That's but right. When you're talking a about child, a kid, then you right. don't know how to combat you, you, that. You don't have that foundation right, right then, right? So you, you just growing up with that. Mm -hmm. and, I agree. And, and even though that, and and, and I was a, a baby in church all the way up to high school, and I started to despise church. And the reason I started to despise church, the seeds was being planted, right? Mm -hmm. But I was like, uh, we had eight grandkids, right? And I was the only one that they would make say Easter speeches up until the time they graduated. They saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, right? Right. And I thought that they uh, another form of bullying. You're picking on me, yeah. Because my cousins, they get up there, they cry, and they don't have to go back no more. You I get up crying? there and cry, and you gonna make me go back <laughs> anyway, right? Yeah. So it it, it causes a lot of uh, a rejection. And they didn't explain it to you that you were special. They didn't explain anything to you? Or you well, just didn't listen? I probably didn't listen okay. because I had tuned out at that time. Okay. Right? But everywhere I would go, people always saw something in me. Right? I go somewhere now, they said, I've seen you somewhere before. Do I know you? And, 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 and they come to find out that that's the uniqueness of being chosen by God. It's a light, right? That, that when, you, when, when you go into the presence of a room, you lights it up. And if people ain't doing right, they get to shaking, right? And they want to move around because they don't know who you are, what you are. They just know it's something about you that they can't figure out at that moment. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. the the thing about uh, despising the church, um, I always uh, look at, I always make it a note to say that the church building is not where it's at. The church, mm -hmm. the, the church person. Is in the heart. Correct. So at the end of the day, um, when you understand that you are a walking assessment of God, you are chosen of God, then at the end of the day, there's something that becomes you as you grow up. But like you said, when you're younger, you don't know what this is. I remember as a kid, I'd ask myself, why am I here? Uh, what is it? What am I here for? I would be walking as a four or five year old asking myself, looking up, looking around, because I was just inquisite when it comes down to trying to understand life. So when you when you look at it from that perspective, trying to figure everything out and then this big bad thing called life start to hit at you at different ages and it start to poke at you, it pretty much teaches you. Life is your best teacher that you'll ever be able to it is. have. And so with that being said, I understand how you could have these issues. I had mine. Uh, you had yours. Growing up, trying to figure it all out. That's what it's all are. about. Yeah. Mm. But then as you get older, you know, like I said, you still going to hit, every time you hit one level, you hit a, a devil. Next level, another devil. Mm -hmm. Every level brings a different devil. You see what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, I'm good with it. I understand that life will hit you like that. But your story is phenomenal in the fact that when I looked at you, you ended up in a, uh, in, in going into getting into trouble. Could you, could we get into that a little mm -hmm. bit? Just like, like, how did you end up and getting into trouble and how old were you when it happened? Uh, um, when I first started getting into trouble, I guess I might have been a senior in high school. Okay. Uh, I didn't smoke my first joint until after I had finished high school, right? And <clears throat> I started stealing right after high school. Okay. Right? And I was a kleptomaniac. Okay. Right? And I would just steal a hubcaps, T-tops, going clothing stores, Kmart, Gibsons, TG and Y. Were you working at that time? Because out of high school, I wouldn't work. You wouldn't work. I had a job at Taco Bell, but I hate punching the clock. Mm. Still to this day, right? So, mm -hmm. so as you done that, where did you hit your roadblock? Um, I would go to jail, and by my parents being who they were, I would always get out. And you live with them at this time? Yes. Um. Uh, I couldn't do no wrong in my mama's eyes. That's but what But she I was wouldn't about go to the ask. store with me. She said, boy, I'm not going to no store with you, right? Probably would have kept you out of trouble. Because uh, would you have stolen with her probably being so. there? I okay. could have $6,000 in my pocket and walk in the store and steal a candy bar. Mm. You know, I feel that you owe me, right? I don't know where that mentality came from, uh, but I feel that things was owed to me, hmm. right? And I didn't want to work for them. And I had good jobs. 
I was a Southwestern Bell Telephone Company operator. I worked at Tyler Pipe. Uh, I worked at UPS, but I wouldn't work long, right? I would always want to take, but what? God would give me, he gave me enough rope to, to what I say, to hang myself. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't to hang myself, it was to find myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was for him to let me run into a spot where he could capture me. Uh huh. And once he captured me, he began to minister to me and he changed my heart, right? Because uh, when I went to prison, I went to prison for a crime that never even happened, right? And I had two yeah. police officers to tell the jury that. Was right. that the first but, time you went to prison? Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, what I because was. Because the other time, still, and I only went to jail. And exactly. Stuff like that. That's okay. just the county or, mm -hmm. or just going in and out, coming going back out. out. What, okay, break that down to me because you say that you was, they, the officers said that you didn't even I do had it. two HPD officers, Houston police officers, that what? testified that the crime never happened. What was the crime? Aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And it was in I Houston. Was, it was in Houston. I was accused of brutally beating someone 32 to 38 times with a full 40-ounce bottle of beer and my fist. And at not one time did they have any cuts, marks, uh, scratches on them. That was the person's testimony. That was the detective's testimony and the police officer's testimony. And for the first time in my life, I witnessed white people that didn't believe what the police said, right? Wow. So I was mad and angry and bitter. And every time somebody would say something to me about God, I would spit fire. Ain't no such thing as no God. Why do all these little babies die? <laughs> and <laughs> all this, because yeah. I wasn't trying to hear it. Yeah. You know, I wasn't thinking about all this, all this karma that was coming back on me, right? From stealing these folks stuff, from help cap, T-tops in the rain, the whole car getting ruined, and all this you know, kind of stuff, right? This never crossed my mind, and I'm just looking at me in this moment. A spoiled kid, that mother always got him out of everything, but now mama can't help you. Can't help so, yeah. you. I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna was, dig deep into was, that. I know that's what I was doing. So, who was the person that you were allegedly um, beating? A was girl, he black was, or white? A uh, black girl. A black girl. Uh -huh. and she, okay. she testified she that testified you didn't. That I did. That you did it. That I brutally beat her thirty-two to thirty-eight. When she first told the police, she told the police that I struck her two times. I didn't never hit her nail time. Did you right? know this female? I did. You did. I did. And you were in Houston at that time? I was in Houston. I was living in Houston at you that time. You were living in well, Houston you, Did you time. and her have any type of relationship? Yes. So this was a girl that you had been with? Had, for about 30 days. Okay, you had been with her for about 30 days. Uh -huh. And y'all probably and she had... stole my car, so I was putting her out. Okay. And when I put her out, this was her form of retaliation. Wow. Mm. So uh -huh. when she told the officers, I mean, nobody... They never took me to jail. So they ne and when they came out during this incident where it allegedly happened, did they see any cuts or any bruises? No, and in they it? testified to that. And they told them that it didn't, it didn't have no. I, cut. If I should have brought my transcripts with me because I packed them around too. I've been really? packing them around for almost twenty five. Twenty five years. And everybody in the jury, what color were they? All white except for a light skinned black dude. Now they want to give me a life sentence, an aggravated life sentence. If they had they had her. I still been in there because I had to do 30 years to come up for parole, right? But this the light-skinned black dude told my mother that he wasn't going to let them throw me away. So they came up with a number 37 and give me 37 years in prison. So on that 37 years in prison, I had to do 18 years, six months, three weeks, and five days to come out of there. Wow. And what year did you go in? Uh, 1996. You went in in 96 and uh -huh. you came out in? 2015. 2015. Yeah. Uh, you know, that accumulate that to a boy meets girl. Yeah. They get married, have a baby. Yeah. The baby go through preschool, elementary, <coughs> junior high. Yeah. And graduate by the time I come up out of there. Wow. Right? And, that, and that, 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 that's crazy for them to, to, to give you that amount of time. Is that the first aggravated assault or assault yes. of any type that yes. you had dealt with? Yes. But you've been in jail for numerous times. For, for, for theft. theft. But, uh -huh. okay, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't really know. But when you are a black man and you have anything on your record, it could be theft, it could be anything, even if it does not, um, it's not even similar to what they're sending you, they look at that, right? Mm -hmm. They look at you as a troubled child for that. Uh, well, I think the system is set up to destroy all black males. And now they don't put the females in it as well. 
right? If you're a black male out here and you're succeeding, uh, you're doing very well. In and, and, and this white man's world, uh, I call it the United States of White America, right? Uh, <clears throat> I'm big in politics now. I lobby bills for myself. I lobby for different senators and different st- uh, 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 representatives around the state, right? And so I am very active in school boards, uh, meetings, uh, commissioner's court, city council, and it blows me away how black Americans don't participate and these things, uh, I was at an event the other night, and it was like a town hall meeting for candidates, a candidate's forum, right? And they want to build a $300 million jail. And you got black pastors that's supposed to be Democrats that's running for these positions, that's standing with the white people on building these jails. You want to spend $300 million to build a jail, why not put that in a human being and make him a better being, right, instead of locking them up? But see, they always need people to bear their burdens, right? And when I was coming up, I didn't want to learn nothing. I was the dumbest kid in school, probably. I made F minuses before, right? Because I was so far withdrawn in my shell that I wouldn't come out. When I go to dances and stuff, I used to stand on the wall. They used to call me a wallflower, right? I didn't want to interact with anyone. Wow. I want to ask you, I want to go back, and I, I definitely I definitely understand where you're coming from, but I want to go back into the fact of when you went into the system. Mentally, how did it how did it do you to be going into a system and, and getting the amount of time you got and then n- knowing that, that you didn't really do what was being, uh, uh, you know, your character being assassinated like that? When you went into incarceration, what unit did you hit first? My first unit I hit was... Uh a unit in Beaver called Gaza East. Gaza. That's, uh-huh. that's Hispanics, what it, right? Nothing but Hispanics. Correct. So there, when you right? hit Gaza unit and you went in there, what, you know, how, where was your mind state? Man, I, was, I, I used to cry every day. How yeah. old were you at this time when this happened? Uh, I was 33. 33. And, uh, and, 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 and you, you cried every day. Every day I was mad. Because you knew that was you were innocent. And you would tell people, uh, man, and, I, and, and I'm people down here for nothing. That, right? I know because they say everybody say that. They, they say everybody say that. So, so, and then I was, uh, my mom was in Tyler. I was living in Houston. But being down there in Gaza, was, <laughs> that, was far, that was super way far, far away from yep, everybody, yep. right? So, <clears throat> and she, they, so she never came and visited, or did she? Not down there, because okay. I wasn't down there long. Okay. Right? I refused to stay down there around those people. I couldn't speak no Spanish. I didn't have no business down there. Yeah. And uh, by me crying every day, they used to send me to see the site, yeah. right? And my thing was, I always wanted, if I'm going to be in prison, I want to go to Chocolate City. That was Darrington. Everything was jumping off in Darrington. Darrington, yeah. So this is where I want to go. So when they sent me to see this little white lady, she said, well, you got to stay here. I said, I don't want to stay here. She said, you got to stay here for two years. I said, I'm not staying here for two years. And every time I would look at her, she would look down. And I would catch up. When I, when I looked down, she would be looking at me. So I hit that disc. Bam! She said, you're right, you can't stay here. So she put me a tram foot and I was gone with that for <laughs> so, I was on the next thing smoking out of there, man. You use your mind? Because when I think about men in prison, and you say you were crying every day, I always thought that you can't, you, you have to put on this tough shell when you're in prison. You can't act like you're crying or nothing like that because, I'm, I'm going to share something some with you about that. And I understand where you're coming from. But I never was tried in my early stage of prison. I can honestly say that I, I I I hold the big three, right? When I went in prison, I had never participated in homosexuality. When I came out of prison, I hadn't participated in homosexuality. When I went into prison, I didn't have no tattoos. When I came out of prison, I didn't have no tattoos. And when I went into prison, I wasn't a gang member. And when I came out of prison, I wasn't a gang member. And when you think of prisons, that's what you think of, of those mm-hmm. three things. That's how they betray it. But I didn't do that by myself. And you never got beat up? You never anything? Oh, yeah. I had some fights. Yeah. Right yeah 18 uh, years, ma- ma- Matter of fact. No, I'm talking uh, cor- in the beginning, especially at ma- Garza, whenever you were crying every Oh, night. no, 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 no. I wasn't there that long, about two mm-hmm. or three days. I oh, okay. that won't put me on that bus and got me out of there. But to answer your question, I had a correction officer to pay inmates $3,000 right. to kill me. Yeah, behind two ice cream sandwiches and two soda water that I didn't know anything about, right? So 
that's why I despise gang members. All wow. of them. Mandingo, Warrior, Disciple, Bluefoot, Crip, Blue, all of them. I hate them. God had you Don't protected. Stay. Man, God had me protected. So all you had to fight around. those guys. Mm-hmm. They would let them in the cell on you and all kinds of stuff. Man, they turned three of them loose on me, right? Because they, the thing was not to even touch me. See, I didn't know that the other gangs couldn't touch me, right? Because Why? I was a neutron. What's that? That means that I don't belong to nothing. Okay. So you have to go get permission to touch a black. Uh, <clears throat> and then they shipped me from. And I get permission from where? From the other my, gang members. To touch you because, oh, okay. Right. So you had one gang that took the money. But they were going to tell the administration that I had a hit on me, thinking that the administration was going to bring me out of population. Their intent wasn't never to do anything with me is what they said in the federal court, right? I'm one of the very few inmates that come through the state of Texas that successfully filed two lawsuits, right? Uh, Both of them in the Eastern District. One of them was in the Eastern District of Lufkin Division, and the other one was in the Eastern District of Tyler Division, right? So they said they were going to jack the officer. But by the administration saying I was a black dude, they never did pull me out of population. Mm-hmm. But I'm having this man's money now. They got to do something. So they brought What that, prison was this at? This was at uh, the Turo unit. It's now called Polanski. Yeah. T- whoa, whoa. When, and what we year were was, like number 11 in the state for murders. What year did you go to the Turo unit? Uh, I went to Turo in 2000. And so when, you, when did you leave? In 2006 and went to Michaels. Yeah. you Did you? you Pimp C had to come. He was at Turo unit. But he was at Turo, the new Turo. The new Turo, yeah, down yeah. Down Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember that. But see, the old after Turo you, though, was that, that death row was. That's right. And that's, that's where you were. Turo. That's where he uh-huh. was at. See, at that time, the prison was very violent. You had the Robinson unit was like number three. French the Robinson. Nation. Uh-huh. Then you had the all red unit, and you had the Turo unit. We had like three or four prisons that was in the top ten for the most violent units in the United States of America. So yeah. them sending you to all of these prisons that had the murder because you were sent to prison for being aggressive. Yeah. For So they're sending you to the to this prison because of that. Because that's what they do. They send you to a certain... But they didn't send me there. God gave me favor. Mm. When I managed to uh, get off of Gaza, they sent me to a, a unit in Rochelle. And it, it was uh, uh, Ramsey 3 at the time. Okay. It's now Stringfellow. And it's a minimum only unit. I was trying to get to Darrington, remember? Mm-hmm. So that was my main thing. I wanted to go to Darrington. But the lieutenant said, well, I can't get you to go to Darrington, but I can get you to go to Ramsey 3, okay. right? And I always thought that Ramsey 3 was full of homosexuals from what I was told, right? But at this time, they had moved all the homosexuals to a Styles unit. Yeah. And Ramsey was a good unit. It was small. But it was like a 10,000-acre unit, okay. right? And at this time, I'm about 315, 320 pounds. So right? you're a big used, dude. And I used to eat six times a day, right? Because that's all I do, eat and cry. But you wouldn't mess with me, right? And I go to the law library. So when they send me down, then the first thing they knew was send me to the field. I go in no field and do no work. So <laughs> One AP. Right? So they bring the ambulance. <laughs> you laid it down. And I laid out. So they bring the ambulance to come get me. The next day they sent me out there, they bring the van to come get me. You did the same thing again. And the next day they brought the horse and wagon to come get me. I'm not being out here in no field. I'm not going to do it. So they locked me up. They you would see. write me cases. And I don't know about no cases. So they locked me up, and I was a minimum in, right? So they changed my custody to medium custody, mm-hmm. right? Because I wouldn't work. Because you're being difficult. And that's when they started shipping me to them renegade units. The first one I went to was All Red. Now I'm still trying to get back down to Darrington. So the only way we could get to Darrington was to put Judaism on our travel card, mm. right? So that was the only unit that had Jewish services at that time. So I put my Jewish travel card on, and I'm trying to get to Darrington. I want to go to Darrington, but I'll call that where it's popping at, right? So the white people caught on to that, and they found the rabbi to go to Robinson unit, right? So I used to have about 13 bags of stuff full of canned goods and everything. Everywhere I go, I had some help to tote all this stuff, right? So when I got, the man told me, he said, how did you get on this bus with all these bags? I said, don't worry about that. I said, I'm going to be back over here in the morning. He said, no, you ain't. I said, yes, I am, because I'm going to Darrington. He said, no, you're going out right here. I said, no, man, I got, I'm, I'm on the Jew chain. He said, Jew change stop here. Ain't nobody else going down south. Yeah. 
So, so he put me out there at uh, Fritz Robinson. Okay. And they were violent out there as well. What year was that? This had to be in like 98. 98. Mm -hmm. And then then after that, um, you know, did you ride? How long did you stay on the on the French Robinson unit? Man, I finally got off that book about, about, about a year. About a year. Uh, my mother went to the doctor and got a doctor's statement to move me closer to home, and that's when they sent me to the terror unit, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my mother did come to visit me, her and my son, when I was on the Robinson unit. So you had a child before you went to prison? I did. My son was 13. Okay. And even though I was still in hubcaps and T-Town, I was the Little League football coach and the Little League uh, baseball coach Wow! at that time. And I started coaching when he was six years old. Man. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when when they move you closer and get you to Terrell unit, mm -hmm. um, uh, this here, now time is ticking. You've done a lot of time at this point. Uh, yes. You, uh, you, and, and I'm still fighting, and right? You, and you're still fighting. How frustrating was that? Man, um, it, ju just just trying to to fight a case like that, knowing that you innocent, did you? you I know you put in for appeal, mm -hmm. and you appealed, and and did they shoot you down on that first appeal? My first appeal, uh, but 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 let me move back to when I was on French Robinson unit. That's when the activists in me really start to come out. Yeah, then, right, mm -hmm. because the Hispanics used to wait to Friday every week to stab each other to wow. lock the unit down. Yeah. Right? Now, I always had commissary and stuff like that, but a lot of men didn't. Right? Uh-huh. So, they did this like three weeks in a row. So, I could find myself going off on them Hispanics. Uh, it was the RUs and the Tongo Blast and they were plexing with the mafia and all these different gangs, right? And I go off on them. And I don't, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know who, who, right? So I'm talking bad to him. Say you got one more time locked this unit down. Then you're gonna be dealing with something, right? So I'm I'm going hard on them. They go to the blacks. Now these Crips and Bloods and MWs come to me and ask me what's going on. I said I said nigga, it's all about you. What's up, man? You can't be talking about that. I said man, let me tell you something. I said every weekend this unit locked down. I said I don't get visits. I said people come from Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth. And when they come up here, and we didn't have telephones at that time. I said, your, your, your wives, your mamas, and sisters, y'all, they can't visit you because we locked down. They turned them around. And one of them spoke up and said, yeah, my, my wife brought my son up here to see me, and we couldn't do it. So now the light began to go off in their head, right, up to what I was doing. So they go back and tell them, man, he right what he's saying. Uh, y'all need to give us notice so we can at least write home and tell our people not to come. Well, you, you're a game man. You should have been doing this all by yourself, right? I shouldn't have to engineer you to do this. Sir. So that's when the politics really started to come out of me and the activism of standing up for my people. Yeah, you. so that's a good thing that you've seen the light at that point, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, so what I wanted to ask you, though, okay, when you were at a terror unit and you said that they were – um, they had paid to to, to um, beat you up or get you killed and uh -huh. stuff like that. How did you find out about that? You never did say. Well, the first when they was intending to jack the officer for the money. Right. That's why the game ain't nothing but snitches. Mm. Right. They go to the administration, tell the administration I got a hit on me. See, they have what they call safe prison, right? But they don't use it for black people. Like if I'd have been a white boy, they'd have pulled me out of population and asked questions. But they didn't even let me know that I had a hit on me. So one day, one Saturday, I was off from work. And um, I'm sitting on the pod waiting for count to clear so I can go get my hair cut. And I see these three dudes come on the pod, but I don't know that they game. I don't know who who, right? I don't know nothing about them. So when I went up the stairs to hit on the one to let the barber know when count clear come out, one of them steal me, right? And when I turned around, I picked him up and threw him on the other one. And I got the best of them. It was three of them, right? And they said, man, I ain't no major hatter like that. Mm -hmm. So I whooped three gang members. Mm -hmm. So that night, they had a meeting. I don't know what's going on still at this point. I don't know why they clicked on me or nothing, right? Now... All the gangs, the Mexican gang, the white gang, the black gang, they got a meeting on the yard, and the meeting is about me. And they sent the coward M.W., the Mandingo warrior, to carry out this mess, right? So now these other gangs want to do them. 
Mm. Because they said, y'all let a neutron make y'all look bad. Mm. Mm-hmm. They said, y'all weak. So three days later, they come back and hit me again, and that's when it got real bloody. Wow. That time, they really kind of got the best of me. What happened? Got, How, what kind of damages did you get? Well, I just got hit in the head with a, with a weight Okay. at that time, right? Now the administration want to lock me up. I still don't to know. To keep what, you safe, really? Yeah, at that point. Right. But why you didn't do it when they first came out? And I'm glad they didn't because that made me look like I was a rat. Yeah. Right. Right. So God know how he fixed things, right? Mm-hmm. And I was able to overcome. So when they locked us up in the game, remember, the game member kept calling me down now. Major. So I don't ever answer. Major, you go down now? So they sent a kite down there. Man, please answer me, man. We wrong. Where's a kite? A this note. Is a note. They sent okay. a note. Uh, saying that how they were wrong, we want to talk to you, they want to try to fix it. So I'm still mad, nigga, why'd you put your hands on me for anyway? I'm not trying to hear nothing you talk about, right? Because you put your hands on me, and that's a problem. So it went on and said, man, that's the administration fault. Nah, nigga, that's your fault. You did that. But we went to the administration, they supposed to be taking you out of population, but you put your hands on me. I deal with them later, right? So they said, man, if you file a lawsuit, we're going to tell everything that went on. And they did. Mm. Wow. So you basically filed a lawsuit and on, the, on the, a judgment. On the officer. On the officer. Well, how I, did that I, make I, you feel? Accomplished inside? Uh, Not really because I ain't got my freedom yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but, yeah, it, but, it, but it, you but, had the sense of I, I, I made something happen. Yeah, right? yeah, I, yeah. I changed the system because... I'm going to tell you what people don't know. I didn't know people can do that while they're in prison, like file lawsuits against. Yeah, yeah, against. you can file writs I'm, I'm, and all I'm going to tell you stuff. something. Black people love Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton a piece of shit. You hear me? <laughs> they called him the first black president. Bill Clinton a piece of shit. When he got up in there in, 19, in, in 1992, he authored a bill called Tough on Crime. That was to lock all black people up. And we don't see that part of it, right? He went through the whole apartment uh, project locking folks up for smiles and mouths of dope. And then he, he went farther in 96 and come up with the uh, 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 the AEDPA, which is the Anti-Affected Terrorism Death Penalty Act, right? That give, that gives you one year to get into federal court or you forever time barred, right? Mm-hmm. So you're taking a, a, a kid that has uh, dropped out of school in eighth grade mm-hmm. and don't know nothing. And you expect them to get to the Supreme Court in one year? That's impossible. Right. Right. When you get lawyers and judges and all them uh, eight or nine, ten years to get their degree and to move forward in the legal system, then he come back that same year and 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 and, and pass what they call the PL, PLRA, which is the Prison Litigation Reform Act. Right. Uh, meaning that you cannot sue a uh, uh, prison or institution for mental and emotional damage. Mm. Well, that's all incarceration is. Yeah, right? exactly. So so he done us more harm than any president in the history of this country. And I go all the way back to George Washington mm. when it come down to black people. But we love him. You know why we love him? He smoke a little weed. We smoke a lot of weed. <laughs> he cheat on his wife. We cheat on our girlfriend. He like blue. We like rap, right? So we figured he was one of us. Mm-hmm. And all the time you putting his foot on our neck. And that's the way Democrats are now. You see what they just did the other day, don't you? And they talking about Martin Luther King. Don't nobody killing about no Martin Luther King. Not even black folks or white folk, right? In 30 years, they're going to have Martin Luther King painted as a white man. Wow. Um, so getting back to you, because I, I want to walk up to the point of how you came to the end of your course being locked up in prison um when you came was which unit did you were you released at and and how many years did you do uh before you left Terrell unit uh i got to Terrell in 2000 they had just moved death row over there because of the guys had escaped from uh um ellis okay Mm -hmm. i remember that i did and um after the contract hit was placed on me, they moved me to the Michael unit. Okay. Right. And at that time, kites follow you. Yeah. Right? Everywhere you go. So before you get there, they know you're there, man, right? Really? Oh, <laughs> them game members, hell, they do everything but the right thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. And did I, you have a lawyer at this time still fighting no, your case or you were fighting your own fight case? I was fighting my own case. When I was on Turl, I filed a writ of Habeas Corpus. 
I filed a writ of habeas corpus when I was on tour unit. And I filed this on December the 2nd of 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, we was getting mail on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Incoming mail and I going mail on Saturdays. So I, I mailed that mail on December the 2nd, which was a Saturday. I put it in the mail room window. I uh, prayed on it, me and my legal partner. Right. And I sent it out. It left the unit on the 4th, that Monday. They got it in Harris County District Clerk's Office on Wednesday the 9th mm -hmm. of 2000. No, the, the, the 6th, Wednesday the 6th of 2000. I get the return receipt back because I had sent it certified on Saturday the 9th. Mm -hmm. To this day, them people say they still didn't get that writ, mm. right? And that was an act of God. So to this point, it still hadn't been a writ filed on my case, mm -hmm. right? Challenging the merit That's why of I my conviction. That's why I believe everything happens for a reason. We don't always see it right then and there uh -huh. when we're going through things, but every single thing happens for a reason. So you, 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 you do you now you're on Michaels. Is that where you were released from? Uh, yeah, that's why I made parole at on Michael's. Yeah, and, and, I stayed and, over that nine years. Nine, nine years, years at Michael's. At Michael. Uh, did you, uh, you did you have a, uh, boy, I tell you, man, you went through a lot of count times, a lot of different things, man, man a lot of child times. And your mom was still alive when you came out? No. So yeah. you lost your mom while? And dad. And Let dad. Let me tell you how cold and white folks were. They told me, they said, you're going home. I had the highest piece of paper it was, a, which was an L-5-1. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm 25 going, a day. Uh-uh, 30. 30 at that time. Uh, I'm going home, bar none. I'm going home. This is what you telling me. I got a release date for May the 30th, I believe, right? My daddy died on May the 5th, and they wouldn't even let me go eulogize my daddy. Wow. Right. But you already say I'm going home. If I go out there and, and, and don't do what I'm supposed to do, you're going to snake this piece of paper for me, mm -hmm. right? So moving back to Michael's, I used to teach Bible study classes. and I believe in God 100%. Mm -hmm. I believe in Jesus Christ 100%. When did you come to that? That's though? exactly what I was going to Because at ask. first you was mad at and, God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was in 1997, 98. Right? But what, what made you change you, your mind? That's God. Right. He like came it, to me. What okay. year and how many years had you been locked up? About three Three. It's about 99. Tell me about that experience. Man, I'm in there, and I hear somebody, like, calling my name. You know, like, I get up and go to the door, because I used to stay in the cells a lot. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to be out there in that living room with them dominoes, and I none of that was never in my agenda. So I keep hearing somebody come in that door, so I go to that door. I like, man, who coming in this door messing with me, man? Nobody been in that door. I said, man, so next time you come in that door, I'm going to throw some hot water out that door, <laughs> man. <laughs> so God said, just look at you. Just look at you. I'm like, what's going on? And he began to put my life before me. I had a motorcycle one time, smooth board, carburetors, struts, headers on there. And I was out there on Interstate 20 running about 180. And the motorcycle just came to a stop. And I'm still giving it gas. And when the motorcycle stopped, the sprocket for the chain fell off, right? On and, the highway. Yeah. So imagine if I was rolling at that speed and that chain would come off and got caught in that tire. Yeah. So he began to show me, and I was in head-on collisions and stuff, where I could have killed kids and family members, you know. Uh, and you didn't notice it at that time when it happened? No, no, no. Till he began to put this before me, all the time that I knew that I should have been a dead man, right? He would put this before me, and he said, I brought you through all of that. What make you think that I'm not going to bring you through this hurdle? And I didn't immediately change, but that stuck with me every day that I would walk. So I started getting uh, correspondent Bible courses and doing them in the mail here and there <clears throat> and get these little certificates and stuff. And I think that what did it because I enjoyed getting them certificates, right? And I still got to stack up to this day, right? <laughs> and I and I would get in the Bible class just to get these certificates, right? And it wasn't for parole because I never wanted parole, right? I wanted to get out on this case. Yeah, ASAP. you wanted to beat them. Parole was 
2015. We still in the 90s, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, so that wasn't even a thing, but but that was rewarding for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. to get something for doing something. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually being rewarded, being productive, being produ- yeah. exactly. Uh, for for doing something. Yeah, right? for doing the so right. So I began to change like this, and and God was building a foundation in me that I didn't understand. Was that when you started looking into your case, or did you start looking into your case doing the law section of it before God came into your life? Before. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from from the from day jail. one, as soon as you got yeah, there, you started definitely. researching about the law. About the law, man. For you to do eighteen years like that, and in your heart, knowing that you didn't do the crime that's being you accused of, and the crime never even existed. The crime never existed mm-hmm. just because of somebody being vindictive and saying something towards you that allegations that wasn't true, and then for you to go eighteen years in prison dealing with. The hoopla and all of the different people, the guards, the the oh, inmates, the, the 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 different uh, uh, jailers, everywhere you went, there was always something. I'm pretty sure of. Man, be sleep at two o'clock in the morning. Man, they come cut the lights off. Yeah, yeah. Butt yeah. Naked, get butt naked. Shake down. You have to st- uh, look at all up your rectum, man. Stash, have to sleep standing up, putting chain busts at one, two o'clock in the morning. Oh man, it's utter really ridiculous what yeah. was going on in yeah. that place. Yeah. I witnessed dude get their throat cuts with Jack Mac tops and yeah. bloods yeah. keeping on I yeah. uh, witnessed officers bringing free world knives, knives up yeah. there to have other inmates killed. Yeah. Uh, stuff going on. Uh, you sent your child in there. You paying your tax dollars for your child to be protected. And you got the people that you paying money to killing your kids, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Right here in the state of Texas. Because politics, everything. And, and, and then you got these girls down there. They're going to get with these dudes. These girls got kids and stuff. Now they going to jail for messing with these dudes. These dudes going to tell on them. As soon as they first chance they get, right, they walk them off and lock them up. I seen all that. Wow. I had a woman that liked me in there one time, right? And um, I said, well, just help me get out of here. Uh, then we can be together. She had a little daughter. You know what that woman told me? What? She said, I was crazy. I said, I'm crazy. You putting your job and your daughter welfare on the line, but I'm crazy. Yeah. I'm not going to get caught up with you and go to see. I went to medium custody for six months for not working. Mm-hmm. I never went to closed custody. I never went to see. I did all my time on minimum custody, but except six months for not working down there for them white folks on Ramsey 3. Right? Do you and feel, that's a blessing. Do you feel that um, men prisons should have female guards? I do. Why? Uh, men are beast. They laying up with each other in there. Uh, oh, it's ridiculous. They got titties and not everything, right? And I was just blessed and covered by the blood of Jesus to not to participate or want any of that stuff. My main focus was to get out of prison as fast as I could, to get out of prison to be with my mama. But I honestly believe, had my mama not died, that I'd still be in prison. Wow. I believe wherever my mama went, she petitioned for my release. How many years were you in there when she passed away? Uh, She passed in 14. January 7, so 2014. So you only had four more years to go. Yeah. One. Now one. One more year. He got out in one year, and your okay. dad passed 30 okay. in, in okay. 2015. Uh-huh. And, and, and you was right there at them at seeing the all at the door. And and so when you say your mom petitioned for you. I you believe do, she went to Jesus. So you believe mm-hmm. that it was because of what, what, what her going to Jesus, just like that story in Luke 18 where the, the he said you ought to always pray and not faint. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I made my first parole, and this is crazy. My offense was against a woman, right? So I, I started my own parole stuff maybe by 2010 or 2011, you know, writing them, telling them, you need to come over here and talk to me. You know, I want to talk to you, right? And I was writing this man uh, that was a parole commissioner, right? And I'm looking for favor, me, man, looking for favor from another man, man right? right. So they just put it, well, we put your letter in your file, you ain't up for parole. So the next year I write a nut, right? <clears throat> so when I did get in the parole shoot, I write this man again, right? And 
I get a parole lay in. I got that paper. I'm going to see Paul Kill, right? When I go to parole, I don't see no Paul Kill. I see his his boss, and she a woman. And all the time, it's going through my mind, it's what amazing. am I going to tell these people when they ask me about this crime? Because if I tell them I didn't do it, then they're going to say, well, he in denial, and he ain't remorse for all this here, right? This is in my mind, the flesh, right? And 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 and, and this is what I'm dealing with all the way up. Now this is you've been that. locked up eighteen years. Uh huh. And 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 this is crazy because the person I wanted to see I didn't see. I seen a woman. She said I come over here to visit you because uh, you had wrote Paul and told him to come. Well, he said since I was already out here today, for me to see you, he says I'm his boss. I'm a board member. See, that's God. And I'm like, ooh, I said, can we pray? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Amen. So I went to pray, and, and I prayed with her. I, I don't guess she ever heard that before, right, from an inmate, want to mm-hmm. pray with her. So she said, I said, ma'am, I got one thing to tell you before uh, you conduct this interview with me. She said, what's that? I said, about 18 months ago, I got busted with some tobacco. She said, some cigarettes? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I don't worry about that. All y'all need to be smoking in there. <laughs> I said, like, ooh, right? And this woman conducted that interview with me, and she never asked me about that case. When that woman was finished to me, she said, have your people to call. This was on a Thursday. Have your people to call Huntsville next week, and you should have an answer. She said, good luck. So... I'm always impatient, right? You know, I can't wait on nothing. And and, and I just read in that Bible just a few days ago uh, about patience. patience. Man, it's not patient. He ain't for a wreck, right? Mm-hmm. So that Friday morning I got up, and I had some homeboys that worked over in the, in the schoolhouse. So I said, man, look out, Beaumont. He said, yeah. I said, man, check that computer. And see if I got an answer. <laughs> you know, it ain't been 24 hours yet. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, seen yeah, that yeah, woman like yeah. about three something that Thursday, right? And uh, he said, man, you know, you ain't got no answer. Didn't you just see them folk yesterday? I said, yeah, boy, my God, go check it for me. So he said, all right. So I went on back to my pod. And at lunchtime, I came back. I said, boy, what did he say? He said, man, I ain't checked it yet. He said, but I'm going to check it for you. So... After lunch, I had a lay-in to go to, to chapel. So I don't forgot about it now. So uh, I'm waiting on the child hall to open up. So I'm on the other side of the unit, and I see Beaumont walking on that sidewalk. I said, man, I supposed to be going to Holly Beaumont. So when I went through the gate, he said, man, I've been out here looking for you for 30 minutes. I said, what's up? He said, man, they're going to let you go. <laughs> he Look said, you got the F I want. Man. I said, what? I said, don't play with me, Boma. So when he told me that. Did you just cry? I, oh, man, I'm about to cry now. <laughs> Say, but when he told me that, man, I said, I like, I said, thank you, man. You ain't playing with me, is you? He said, no, man, they're going to let you go. So it's like that. We've been trained not to believe what black people say, mm-hmm. right? So I, I said, man, let me go in this chaplain office. <laughs> so I went around to the chaplain. And I said, chaplain, can you take the computer and see if them people going to let me go home? He said, you know they ain't going to never let you go home. I said, that ain't what I asked you. Just check that computer. So he got on the computer. He checked. He looked. He looked at me. He looked back. He said, well, right here, say you got an L5-1. <laughs> wow. I said, all right, thank you. And I went on up out of there. Right? Man, boy, I tell you, man, and, and you, what was the scripture that you held on to that, 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 just kept you going. Man, at that Psalm end. 27, 13. It kept you going. I would have lost hope unless I seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wow. Mm. Right? And and in 2006, when I was attacked by those gang members, God gave me that ministry, continuing faith in Christ ministries, right? He, he, he birthed that in me. And for some reason, it stayed with me. And when I got out in 2015, they tracked me from space, right? They had me in a program called SISP, Super Intense Supervision Program, where I had to have a leg monitor on and a phone on my hip. I couldn't go nowhere. If I let the phone here and go outside, I'm violated. 
I had to have, I had to wear this thing for 13 months and 11 days, and that's a timely manner, right? I got off as fast as I possibly could without any violation or any interruption. Some guys still in that thing six, seven, eight years mm. because if you do six, eight months and you violate, you got to start all the way back oh, over from yeah. the beginning until you complete the, your program, right? The program was 12 months, but it took them an additional month for all the paperwork to go through the proper channels. See, I know about the leg monitor, but I didn't know a leg monitor and a phone. Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's a game. It's, it's a serious game going on, man. Uh, uh, you and, and, and so... After you come home, I want to get to the education right. part because we we definitely don't want to hold miss up your out time on that. Mm-hmm. But but to be after you get out to pursue your education, or did you pursue any while you was in there? Or this all happened on the outside. My education came from the outside. I wouldn't go to school in prison. I didn't want a prison education. Uh, I stayed in the chapel and the law library. I was educate myself in law and in, in, in theology, basically. So when you came home and you went to school, what was it that what what, what made explain you? explain to us the educational process of what right. you done when you came home? Well, when I came home and I got the leg monitor off, it was in twenty sixteen mm-hmm. when it took it off. Thirteen months I, after I, I went, I went to uh, enroll in uh, Texas College, which is an HBCU okay. yeah, in I, my I town, know. right? Uh, I had setbacks where I went to back to jail for ten months. Uh, Why? Uh, Again, they lied on me. My record was bad. Uh, when you lie on a person, parole don't care. They gonna come school well me anyway. School yeah. me up until they find out what's going on. But I was enrolled in school, right? That was the first stumbling block, right? I overcame that. I got back in school, and it was a struggle. Uh, I went to jail again. Um, this parole thing is giving you tough time, man. I, and I don't know how to live out here. Yeah, and that's I, something I, I, I wanted did, to I talk. Didn't know how to live I wanted to talk about that because when you left, Tupac was just he just died. Uh-huh. Tupac got that, killed. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, September and then, 20, yeah, yeah, and then nineteen ninety six, nineteen ninety six, and then you come out in twenty fifteen mm-hmm. when they got uh, all type of cell phones, oh, all type crazy. of <laughs> all type of stuff going on far as uh, different type of cars. When you left in nineteen ninety six, that you, baby <laughs> lack was out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That the baby lack had just 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 uh, went down. Then in twenty fifteen, fashion is totally different. Fashion is different. Yeah. Everything is totally different, and you walk out of those. Uh, you got out at the Walls unit at the Walls unit. Yeah, you come out at the Walls unit, and you 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 get that what the hundred and fifty dollars. Man, they probably gave me a hundred dollars. A hundred. And you didn't have nowhere to go because then you had your, your mama, mama and your dad away, passed, your daddy away. passed no, away. No, no, what I tell you, while ago, Jesus would ride with me. Yeah. <laughs> so where did away. you? So I went home. <laughs> it was his. I'm still home. Yeah, his house. <laughs> yeah, got, got, got yeah. him a place. Wait, 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 see, my mother died in 2014. My dad died in 2015. My son, when my mom died, my son was took living. over the house. Okay. And he was, you know, keeping it up while and I was And how old was he at that time when your mom died? Because you've been crazy. gone 30, you've been gone 33. 18, 33. 30, yeah, so he had grown, right. <laughs> he, had, he, he, had been, he was 33. Uh, when when he went, came out, he was 13. When, when, he, when, when he went, went in, it was 13. When he got out, he was 33. 33. When he went, he was 33. And when I you got, got out, out at 53. At 53. What's crazy. up with all these threes? Got to ask God that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but the thing is, when you come home and, and you see all these new things, what was the biggest thing that stuck out to you? I got to ask you that because I know we was getting into the education, but mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you that. Like, what stuck out to you the change the most? Like, wow. Man, uh, I got that monitor on when I'm in Dallas at the bus station. So I walked from bus station to a 7-Eleven and bought me a cell phone, a uh-huh. flip phone. And I'm trying to work. I don't know what I'm doing. So I just throw it to the side. So when I get home, it was on a Friday. So that Saturday, my son, had he had a cell phone. And he came. He said, uh, I'm going to give you this cell phone right here. I got your number already in it. Uh, I got me another one. He said, huh, here you go. So he put me on this site, right? And when the phone rung, a picture jumped up, right? And I slung it across the head <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't a regular ring, right? It was like, woo, 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 woo. I said, oh, man, what is this? And then I walked over there, I looked at it, and then the picture was up there, and it was stood up, and it was kind of shaking, right? So I called him in, I said, man, what's wrong with you? He said, man, you got the answer. <laughs> 
So, you know, we got man. it down so, you know, you know, I started progress a little bit from man. that, right? Let me see these pictures. What year was it? Because I don't want to miss out on these pictures being showed on, on the screen. Could you make sure that we get a good picture of that on there? What year, what what was that picture there? What where, what year was that? Uh, that had to be about 2008. 2008. Uh-huh. Okay. And then this one right here. Uh, what unit was you on when you took that one? On Michael's. Michael's unit? Uh-huh. And then this one right here, what, where, where were you at? I was on the Michael unit there. That As was well. 10. Who, got, who had a camera up in there? What was going on? That was the visitation? The visitation. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, For yeah. different uh, programs that I was in, once you graduate and finish, they would take out pictures. I, I never touched a cell phone in prison. Yeah. I never touched. Even when my mama died, I had people bring me cell phones, right? And you wouldn't even be I never one. touched them. Uh when my mama was dying, I had caught her tobacco cases. They stitched yeah. on me because I was trying to sell cigarettes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, doing, you know. Trying to make it through, make to, a living. To, hustling, right? So uh, uh, they when they told on me, they come in there. They had telephones at this time, but I lose my telephone privileges. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, my mother came uh, up there on October the 5th of 2013 okay. to tell me that she had only six months to live, right? Wow. And And uh, I didn't see it, right? So, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. But as soon as she left, she started to deteriorate. Yeah. Right? So, after that was, you know, I just kept doing what I was doing, law library and chapel. That's it. Wow. What was but, about that? Well, um, on these pictures, I know is this one you were so serious, and then this one you were smiling like it. I don't know. I, that, that, the sincere look, I've been had that all my life, right? Uh, my aunt asked me when I was about 10, why was I always looking so serious? Serious, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, because that one, he just laughed, the smiling, like, oh, really. Oh, oh, oh. I'm like, well, what's up with that? I don't know. I must have seen some of them. Yeah, well, but, you know. So let's move on to the education. education yeah. Um, so um, what made you choose? Because I would think that when you came out, you don't want to get into law, like, be a lawyer to try to, you know. Well. Uh, why not that? Because in Texas, they won't certify me to be a lawyer. I'm a but, convicted but, but, fellow. Mm-hmm. Now, Texas Southern has my case in this innocence projects down there right now, and they're working to prove my innocence, right? <clears throat> now, I don't know if my, my death convictions will keep me from being a lawyer, but my thing is that I want to be somewhere around the criminal justice field, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, so what was the major? My major, when I first went started college, mm-hmm. uh, was business administration. Okay. Right? But it was just I was taking my basics. Yes, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. So, so once I got my basics out the way, I changed my major to criminal justice. Mm-hmm. Wow, and and so now you've been actively going, like you said last week, you was downtown Dallas because mm-hmm. somebody had gotten convicted. Uh huh. What was uh, that Draylon about? Patterson. Uh, Dr- Draylon Patterson. He was uh, uh, accused of being an uptown rapist. Okay. Uh, I don't think that he raped nobody. I think that he was out having sex with prostitutes, prostitutes. and didn't pay them. And they pull that card, which is yeah, my situation wasn't dealing with no prostitute, but it was dealing with a woman scorned, mm-hmm. right? So that's why I came in to try to assist in that. Wow. So when right. you meet these people, and because when you hear these cases, you go down here to speak to them to figure out is it true or not. How can you discern, okay, this person is willing for me to fight for them? Well, I'm, I'm like this right here. I don't care what a person did. I don't care if you're guilty or innocent. Only thing I care about is your constitutional rights being protected. Okay. Right? Because white folk guilty all the time. Mm-hmm. They've been guilty, right? But if, did they violate your constitutional rights in the process? Okay. And nine times out of ten, they did. Wow. I got you. And, and, and because, and I love the way you break that down in, in a way, and the reason I say that, uh, really, is it, what happened with the white man, it happened. You know, mm-hmm. and we can't go back and change what can't happened with, change. with our history and what we had went through. But you got to understand that if there's an opportunity, you know what I mean, and we can help uh, try to help our people that that a lot of time are going through a lot of a lot of things mentally because of what our people been through. Our people been through a lot. Like you said, you talked about uh, Bill Clinton. You talked about different things that that you went through as a kid growing up. Um, you didn't touch on racism a lot during your young childhood, but being in in the country and dealing with the things that you've seen growing up, you understand what was going on. And and your I know your mom and your dad went through, and your mom's mom and your mom's dad 
and mom went through. It, we start looking back. You go back 100 years. You go back to 150 years and you start to look at the lifestyle that they're having to deal with. And you start to see that this is what you came up under. You came through this to get to who you are now. Mm-hmm. These people are the ones that the, genetically inclined. It's in you to where you now react to things a certain way. I believe things are passed down genetically. Mm-hmm. So so mentally, you still have things that you deal with that that you don't understand. Certain things that, like we was talking about my my son and and the fact that how picky he is with his foods and all that stuff. And some of the ways that he sat back and looked that he don't even know he's looking like my dad. But I know that this is in him. So these are things that that, that do affect us. And and we can't get caught up in the fact of saying, oh, man, we, we went through that. Then we, got, we got different opportunities today. Yeah, but you still got some mental conditioning to deal with. See, my thing with, 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 with us black people, we don't want to learn who we are. We don't want to learn. Uh, we, we don't want to study. We don't want to read. We want to drink and drug. And, 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 and when we drink and drug, we think we covering up pain and hurt. When actually we're making it worse Right, until you face your opposition, you can't never correct it. Until you face and find out what happened to your forefathers and your foremothers, then you don't know how to defend it. Right, so we want to educate our people, especially our youth. You know, uh, uh, let them school names stay the same. Let Robert E. Lee stay up there. Let John Tyler stay up there, <clears throat> because once you start turning that stuff down and changing the name of your school which is probably what white America wants you to do. You forget about the, what Emmett Till and them went through, the Mavis Everest went through, uh, the, 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 the story about uh, uh, Birth of a Nation, uh, what's, what's his name? Birth of Nat a Nation. Turner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we forget about that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, white people want us to, uh, uh, black people don't know, we were Republicans. We weren't no freaking Democrats. The Democrats started the Ku Klux Klan. Right and the police department, they were called slave catchers. They had dog called nigger eaters, but now you were a part of the came stand together. Not even on the city level, state level, or national level. Wow, man, that's Daryl Davis, man. Daryl Davis. Um, so how many? Uh, how long did it take you to get your uh, get finished through school? I, got I see you looking years. good, man. Four years. <laughs> yeah. You did that four years. Yeah, I got locked up two times. <laughs> <laughs> but you here? Yeah, and you done it. Hey, it let me see. Here. Let me see what you got here, <laughs> okay. man. So this, this is, is my social social arts man. You should be so proud of this. That's bro. my social arts degree. Social right arts degree right here, uh-huh. man. You see it. Uh-huh. So are you going back to school to to get any other degrees? Uh uh-uh, uh, they want me to go get my master. Yeah, this that's is, what I was wondering. Get your master's is, and your doctorate. This is my uh. Wow, my you should be so degree you, in you, criminal justice. Man, here you go, baby. You show it to the camera because I mess up. Man, <laughs> at any rate, man. Whoa, man. This is man. This is nice. Man. So uh, Daryl Lynn Davis. That's me. Man, bachelor's of science in criminal justice with all rights, privileges, honors. Uh, 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 appertaining there are two given under the seal of the college of tyler texas on the on on the this 15th day of may uh 2021 man you should be so proud and i man. made and, and i made the honor roll and you made and the, the, dean's roll, list. the dean's list uh-huh. man they beat man. me out of point two points i could have made the president hey, so you know I'm, i went from making l minors to being an honor roll student man right so, so, so anybody can do it right anybody if they put their heart to and it. And put their heart to it. And they and mind. put God first, right? Man, God got to stay first. Wow. So how I, did you get how did you get them to start to fight for your case at that school? I didn't. They contacted me. I done got out of prison and I, and, and the University of Houston had my stuff. When I was in prison, that's all I did was write. Man, I had I wrote so much I had a big uh, uh ball come up oh, over yeah, my man. finger. Right, man. Writing and litigating. Uh when nobody answered me, they wasn't trying to hear me, but I never gave up. And that's why I'm so um, messed up with the NAACP. They don't help nobody, which is why I started Equality and Justice for All, DLD, right? We want to help people, uh, not just black people, but people, human beings, because what I tell people when I speak is it's four things that a child have no control of. That's who their mother going to be, who their father going to be, what gender they going to wear, and what skin color they going to wear. God chooses that for us, mm-hmm. right? And if we claim to be God-fearing people and God-loving people, we have to accept people for who they are, right? I agree. 
How yeah. easy it is to find out. Um, because people say all the time, because I always say the Internet is here for you to find out anything you want to know about um, the law, your rights, so forth. And you talk about um, people out here who are on drugs or drinking and so forth and not able to find this information out. But you have people who are regular working people who are so comfortable in their life who are not interested in to find out their rights until a police stop them and they start arguing until they put into a certain situation. Then they start to research. But what would you say to people in general that they need to know and how easy is it to find out all of these rights? Because sometimes when you're looking at social media or not even social media, the Google, you have to put in the right set of words to figure out the information. Man, what I figured out with Google, all you got to do is talk to it. It's going to tell you whatever you <laughs> ask. <laughs> right? So yeah. I, I figure our people, we're unconscious people. We don't want to know. We want to know a bunch of bullshit. Mm. It don't matter, right? Or uh, like I was stating a while ago, uh, we don't go to no meetings, we don't participate. Uh, we be now we be the first to know what a party's at, mm-hmm. uh, what they gonna have at the club. DJ so and so got this going down, but you don't never post nothing about. They got a school board meeting at eight o'clock. They got a city council meeting at nine. <laughs> they got a commissioner call. You know, I don't. You don't see nothing on social media. Why, Why not? not? It's on certain groups, but you have to be a part of those groups yeah. to be able to see it. Why not? For regular people post it. They post everything they else. else. Mm-hmm. Right? We had a school. I call it Northside High School right here, but it used to be called John Tyler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got a school. It used to be, I call it Southside High School. It used to be Tyler Lee, Robert E. Lee, right? They got $600 million worth of bonds to build two schools in that city, right? They only build one high school in Where that city. Where the rest city. of the money come? They gave the other one a facelift, right? The black school, Northside High School, you give it a facelift. Then beside that, you go two and a half years and don't have no kitchen in the school, right? I went undercover and investigated that and broke it before the school. Boy, you feeding our kids like inmates? You preparing their food from a closed down middle school and shipping it over there to them, and they don't even know what's going on? That's a problem. That's a big problem. Did you get that resolved? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> you know, <laughs> How hard is it to get something like that resolved? It's very hard because I don't have no help. I was the only one. I don't have no kids over there, right? It was and how sp- long did it take for you to get it resolved? Not long. Because once I put it out there, everybody began to want to know about it now. So they said, we're working on it. We're working on it. <clears throat> so when they finally did have a ribbon cutting ceremony, they had the kitchen in there. Mm-hmm. But when I was first started inquiring about it, they said they forgot to put the kitchen in it. Okay, I'm all right with that. We are human beings. We forget, right? But you ain't forgot for no three years. Mm. Wow. Right? So that you would never intend to put no kitchen in there, right? So uh, I was out there with my sign, why my child, where my tax dollars going, why no kitchen. You by yourself. By myself, right? I'm always by myself. You know, people don't want to get involved until it's directly affected them, yeah. especially our people. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, I just can't just totally bash white people uh, because they will support a cause when we won't support our own cause. So when you did that, did you ever get anybody to start coming out? and No, I didn't come out. Just you by yourself. And you got to change I got, by I got yourself. Another, I got another guy that uh, he went to school board with, a meeting with me but for coming out holding signs and demonstrate, because I don't do no protest, and I just demonstrate. Uh, he he come to the school board and spoke over there in the school board meeting. Well, here's what I want to do. Throughout <clears throat> this year, I'll be uh, contacting you again just to see where you're at with different things mm-hmm. and different things that you're dealing with. And mm-hmm. um, just be looking to hear from me. I'll have you back on periodically because okay. I feel like, you know, um, just your progress and the stuff that you're dealing with because you're out here being an activist, doing the things that it takes to try to push change in, in the places where it needs to be. We would love to see you back on here mm-hmm. throughout the uh, throughout the course of 2022, if that's all right with you. Man, most definitely. Next time I tell y'all about how my mama got attacked and robbed when I was in there. Oh, yeah. We're going yeah. to talk so about all of that. Like, so, that. Ooh, so um, what injustice, because you seem like you're always fi- fighting injustice, other than your personal case, are you trying to fight coming up? Uh, right now I'm interested in a case going on where a black guy married a white lady, white girl. They had a baby, the baby three, the baby died. They got both of them in jail on capital murder case. 
but they just seeking the death penalty against the black man and not the white woman. Mm. And I got a problem with that because when I was locked up, they had a situation where this black guy ran with a group of white guys. The white guys go kill another one because I think he was a homosexual. I think, you know, I don't know Alleged. if he was. Alleged, can you read Alleged. it Alleged, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the black guy was the only one got the death penalty, and he wasn't the one to do the killing. From that same town, Smith County. Wow. I just thank you so much, man. God is, you know, basically uh, the reason why you're able to do everything that mm -hmm. you've done. And man, I applaud you for it. Man, I applaud you uh, big time. For I just thank you all for the opportunity. Man, for, you know, come on, man. We just out. getting started. Yeah. We just getting started. We're going to continue to push, man, and try to use these microphones as a way to where we can pretty much help you to push your agenda in a way to where it can affect change. And somebody that been through something or going through something may hear something that we say through you that can help change a life, man. Thank you so and, much, Daryl. I have a little YouTube page. You know, I'm trying I'll to start it, it up. Uh, Daryl L. Davis, 2719 Show. Uh, check me out. Subscribe. I got a lot of... Uh, Legislature on there where I'm down there in Austin, uh, other other little different clips where I'm monkey shining, but it's be real. Let's talk about it. Daryl L. Davis, two seven one nine show. Hey, and if there's somebody who is trying to fight for a brother, uncle, sister, whoever, and don't know how to fight for these people, and would love to get your help, how can they reach out to you? And equality and justice for all. D L D P O Box fifty one eighty one, Tyler, Texas seven five seven one two. Uh, my phone number is 903-944-4443. Easy number to remember. Reach out. Uh, contact me. I'll be willing to come anywhere in the state of Texas at this moment. Man, that's so much love, man. So much love. And, and I, I thank God for you, man. And man, I appreciate you, I thank God you, for y'all and yeah. y'all platform to, you know, to produce stuff like this. Oh, right man, now. we feel the you work. Know, you got so much madness out there. And, oh, we feel and, the and work. And that uh, we, we need our people need to do better, man. We gonna do better. And, and, and by I'm seeing my struggle from being thrown away in that concrete jungle for 18 years, six months, three weeks, and five days to come out to where I am today, it's only by God's amazing grace. But God is not a God of partiality. What He do for one, He'll do for another one. See, people don't yeah. understand how God works. People look at situations and feel like. I don't know, why is he doing this or why is he doing that and not realize that God is preparing you for something greater down the line. And That's people it. tend to judge. They're not sitting down and, and, and being patient because most human beings like us are not patient. Just like what you are saying earlier, you don't like to sit still. You like it to know what's going on. And we have to realize God is not a right now God. He's an on time God. So we, we're in a microwave society, right? That's why we're suffering from this, what they call COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Because we want everything right now. And Man. what my husband always says is that you have to meet people where they're at. You have to meet people where they're at. And that's the thing is, you that's can't judge people. you got to meet people where they're at. Man, right. thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. Man, thank you all for we having me. We did it. We did it, man. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101. And we out.